So effectively, my um, contribution is focusing on large listed companies on the stock exchange, those that are particularly important, of course, for the economies of the UK, the US, uh, but also increasingly for uh, continental European economies like Spain as part of the Capital Markets Union, the uh, whole plan of uh, deepening financial markets and using financial markets, capital markets in particular for shares and the listed corporate sector as a way of developing further um, the uh, European economy. So, and of course, uh, in line with the spirit of the panel, which is very much on uh, social interest, uh, my question in a way for this presentation is whether we can expect shareholder empowerment, shareholder engagement and activism to be a force that um, influences uh, corporations uh, towards uh, higher levels of social responsibility and sustainability or towards the opposite. So is assessing uh, shareholder engagement and activism in listed companies from the perspective of the social interest. However, we define that because, of course, this is quite a contentious topic. So much of what I will cover is not really looking at, at the law as it is, either in the UK, uh, where is my academic position, or uh, in, in the EU, but more around the big policy issues that should inform the way we think about the paths that the law can take in the EU um, over the next few years. And when I say those paths, I mean, obviously, we have heard already about the intricacies of defining uh, shareholder duties and also um, the um, situation regarding the duties of particular institutional investors, such as fund managers or pension fund trustees. Um, but we, we could think broadly, in general, of um, legal interventions that can enhance and empower shareholders uh, perhaps at the same time imposing on them positive duties of engagement and sustainability. And we can think of alternative policies of actually uh, restricting or limiting the um, power uh, of shareholders to intervene in corporate governance. So these are like the, the policy choices. And uh, although the, the second style of, of, of policy path is not uh, what is currently or, or traditionally being followed by the EU, uh, policy makers, we have examples of, of that traditionally, for instance, in the United States, where some of the uh, securities regulation has traditionally restricted, in effect, the ability of shareholders to um, um, make proposals and to uh, set the agenda in, in uh, listed companies. So that's an area of significant policy relevance and interest, particularly in the UK, I've put here uh, the new edition of the stewardship code that will be coming out later this year is for the first time explicitly requiring um, investors to um, take into account uh, environmental, social and governance factors, ESG factors, including climate change. Now, this does not necessarily say that those factors will have to be more important than financial performance, but it does say that they have to be taken into account alongside other uh, factors, um, which shows the high profile of, of the issue. So when we're speaking about shareholder stewardship, in a way that is the, the potentially positive vision of, of the role of shareholder engagement regarding um, the social impact of companies, because if we see shareholders as, as responsible stewards, this idea, that's an interesting quote from um, a book uh, that actually takes a skeptical perspective vis-a-vis -vis the um, role of shareholders. So by setting out the vision is effectively we're expecting shareholders to um, in encourage companies to have a distinctive business purpose, focus on long-term uh, <laughs> objectives, engage closely with stakeholders, including and primarily employees, but not only employees, and um, see the value of the company acting as a reasonable corporate citizen. So that is like the ideal. Now the opposite to that, the flip side, the opposite typology would be shareholders engaging with companies or uh, launching activist campaigns in order to extract short-term value, to strip the cash from 
cash rich companies, encourage companies to reduce uh, investment in research and development or employment, uh, potentially um, encourage uh, hostile takeovers that may lead to massive redundancies. So these are the two opposite visions. And the question is, what is more likely to represent reality given the experience so far? Because the answer to that question really uh, should inform uh, the design of policy. So theoretically speaking, I mean, shareholders can potentially do good in the area of um, corporate social responsibility and sustainability. How can they do good? First of all, they may explicitly take into account non-financial performance when uh, acting as corporate governance actors, when voting, when uh, approaching the board, when engaging. Uh, they could do that, and sometimes, as we will see, they do that. But also, more generally, good corporate governance uh, driven by shareholder engagement can improve the way companies are run, prevent uh, fraud, prevent um, um, various situations that eventually are bad, not only for the shareholders' financial interests, but also for broader society. On the other hand, however, uh, shareholders may also encourage an excessive level of risk-taking. Now, what is an excessive level of risk-taking depends really on the public interest and the industry we're talking about. Some of my previous work is looking at, at uh, corporate governance in banks and argues that uh, the shareholders have had probably a negative impact uh, in encouraging banks to take levels of risk that are um, against the social interest in financial stability. And this, of course, has knock-on consequences on broader stakeholders in society. And, of course, that if shareholders focus on short-term profit maximization, then that makes life difficult for directors, for management, if they want to pursue socially sustainable uh, policies. Uh, so what does this depend on, really? intellectually, if we ask the question, uh, how can we analyze the problem? I mean, obviously, we need to understand what are the real motivations of the shareholders. Are they purely financial or not? To the extent that financial motivations are important, does good CSR performance contribute to better financial performance? And does it make sense for the shareholders as an investment strategy? In other words, as the business case that um, was mentioned before. And of course, the perennial issue that even if something like long term investment in social sustainability and environmental sustainability is in the best interest of the ultimate beneficiary, say the pension fund, the employee whose pension is taken care of by the fund, then may, it may not be in the interest of the people actually making the decisions. So that is the question around the long chain of intermediation and agency problems within that chain including questions of short-termism in the capital markets, particularly regarding hedge funds. So I will briefly now review empirical studies and other studies, uh, qualitative studies, that um, exist and try to answer these questions. Um, so are shareholders purely investing for financial gain? Well, the answer is, briefly speaking, 10, 15 years ago, yes, it would be purely for financial gain. Nowadays, not anymore. Of course, there are a number of uh, funds, uh, impact investment funds that particularly focus on investing in uh, resource efficiency, education, sustainable um, uh, transport, and other socially worthy causes, uh, while at the same time trying to create a healthy financial return. For a long period of time, particularly in the US, there has been the issue of uh, pension funds or uh, which um, uh, work uh, for uh, the public sector or universities or other non-for-profit entities taking into account social issues. And this, of course, has been seen negatively by some of the American academia because it detracts from the idea of profit maximization, but from our perspective here, could be positive. And there is also widespread adoption of ESG factors by mainstream institutional investors in the last few years, but this does not seem to have a very significant uh, impact in reality. Um, so if we look a bit deeper, of course there is some evidence showing that 
uh, a significant percent of 60 percent of um, US investors do consider a company CSR um, uh, record uh, when voting um, and shareholder proposals in the United States regarding ESG issues increased by more than 100 percent between 1997 and 2013 and many of them are on financially immaterial issues, therefore on matters that will not impact directly the profits that the shareholders will reap. From a UK context, there is less direct evidence, but there is very recently um, a, an interesting paper by Anna Tilba and Tarot Reisberg uh, appearing in the Modern Law Review in 2019, which is a study of UK pension funds and shows that most of them do not engage actively with companies and do not take into account uh, ESG issues are uh, mostly because of the traditional emphasis on the fiduciary duty towards um, um, the uh, people covered by the pensions to maximize their financial interests, although that is, legally speaking, a very restrictive interpretation of the duty. So, on the more business question, does better corporate social responsibility performance improve profitability? That's the business case for CSR. And is uh, engagement on these matters a better investment strategy than, say, passive index investment? Well, to make a long story short, the evidence is mixed. There is some evidence that CSR is good for business, but not always, and it is quite um, doubtful whether uh, a fund that engages actively and encourages companies to uh, have a better um, uh, social performance, if you like, uh, make more money than uh, conventional, uh, conventionally managed funds. Uh, however, there seems to be some encouraging evidence, particularly for those um, funds that engage in uh, uh, socially responsible investment uh, activism. Um, so there is some hope, there is some evidence, but it's far from a clear-cut case. And this lack of, of clear evidence leads to statements like this from a UK uh, pension fund uh, CEO, again quoted in the same uh, piece of research, saying effectively that we can't really prove to our investors that engaging um, will bring a better financial return. And because we're bound to the best financial leaders of our members, we have to avoid legal challenge. And therefore, we take the safe option, which is to not engage at all, either on ESG issues or any, on any other matters. <coughs> and that is, unfortunately, the view of, of various uh, in investors in the UK. Now, of course, there are additional problems that I will not dwell on. For instance, the long chain of intermediation. What is in the interest of the ultimate beneficiary may not be in the interest of uh, the asset owner, let alone the asset manager. Um, and in that area, I will just observe that uh, there are p very, very detailed uh, regulatory rules regarding, say, pension funds and other form of uh, mutual funds in a national NTU law trying to protect investors, and they're very worthy rules for their own um, uh, rationale, but the outcome, if you like, of those rules tends to be that um, they encourage diversification of portfolio, which might limit the ability of meaningful engagement. So they might have a negative unintended consequence in the area of uh, ESG engagement. Now, one area that has attracted a lot of criticism and will be my last um, uh, subject of discussion is particularly hedge fund activism. That is a very big issue in the United States. There have been a few high-profile cases in the UK in the last 10-15 uh, years, and it has attracted a lot of criticism as the archetype of, of short-term driven activism that is really uh, transferring value from other stakeholders to uh, the shareholders uh, by, for instance, uh, um, leveraging the company, making the company incur very high levels of debt, uh, stripping the cash, uh, laying off employees, etc. Now, this the evidence is quite clear that as an investment strategy, it seems to be working, right? It makes lots of money for the hedge funds that follow it. But what about the broader public interest? It does seem to improve operational efficiency, but we don't really know if those improvements last in the long term. And 
it's not quite clear from empirical studies whether it actually harms other stakeholders or not. But it does seem to be the case uh, for instance, uh, the late American professor uh, Lynn Stout, who sadly passed away last year, uh, has been very, a very vocal critic of hedge fund activism, particularly because of its impact on stakeholder interest. And we can see an example of that in the takeover of uh, Cadbury by Kraft in the UK, where um, activist funds were quite important in pushing the board to accept the takeover that uh, there has been, of course, uh, plant closures and, and layoffs of employees despite the opposite reassurances given before the takeover. So that is pretty much a type of shareholder engagement that goes very much uh, to challenge uh, the ideal of stewardship and um, uh, engaging with ESG matters. So to conclude, I would say that there are all different types of shareholders. We cannot give a single answer to the question, does shareholder empowerment engagement uh, improve uh, the social footprint of listed companies or not? It depends who the shareholders are. It depends on uh, what are the motivations and what is the business and investment strategy. And of course, it is quite positive to see that there are now uh, particular funds focusing on uh, social matters and that those funds seem to be financially sustainable because they seem to be making money as an investment strategy. But at the same time, we do have quite opposite phenomena like hedge fund activism. And therefore, for the law, the, the very crucial question is how to encourage and empower the types of shareholder <laughs> engagement and activism that are positive from the perspective of um, environmental, social and governance matters and how to discourage those that are negative because uh, usually legal rules have to be formalistic, have to be based on whether you own shares, thresholds of ownership rather than necessarily the type of the shareholder. And in, in that area, of course, uh, we can discuss uh, ideas further in question time. Thank you for your attention.